Welcome, everybody. Um, today, I'm excited about our episode. It's about how a formerly incarcerated teen and his mother are mother's love are fighting mass incarceration. I'm Ashish Kosh, the founder of Conscious and Bias, a movement to build belonging in the workplace, and CEO of the diversity staffing firm Higher Talent. We have some very special guests today sharing a powerful story about overcoming adversity and making a positive impact. Let me introduce Marcus Bullock, an entrepreneur and CEO of FlickShop, an app that connects family members to their incarcerated loved ones, and his mother, Reverend Dr. Sylvia Bullock, who is the inspiration behind the idea of, for the company and serves as FlickShop's relationship manager. It's been said that personal problems are public issues, so I want to touch upon the fact that our justice system is broken. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, the U.S. incarcerates more than any other country, more people than any other country in the world, including China, in part because other countries do not use prison as a one-size-fits-all crime solution. Um, in, in the conversation with Marcus and Sylvia, we're gonna, she'll, they will shed the light on how this costs all of us. Welcome, every, welcome, Marcus. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bullock. Um, can you share a story of what a flick shop and what it does and how it got started? Thank you so much, Ashish. This is going to be so much fun. So before we jump in, like I have to say, this is the first time that my mom and I have ever um, done, uh, had a conversation like this together. And while we had such an interesting journey growing up and getting to this point, um, and even maturing the company to get here, uh, I'm so grateful to be able to share this moment with her. So this is, I kind of, I have to acknowledge that because this is really cool for us. We're excited. <laughs> yeah, you guys get to be the first ones. So we wanted to build the, the technology that helped reduce recidivism around the U.S. Um, our FlickShop mobile app and our website, our web apps, it allows for our, our community of users to have the ability to take a picture, add some quick text, press send, and for 99 cents, we print that picture and text on a real tangible postcard that we ship to any person in any sale anywhere in the country. Uh, in jails and prisons around the country, mail call is the number one thing that every person that's sitting in those sales, they look forward to. It's the singular way to be able to show that there's love and care and consideration on the other side of those fences that are waiting for you. And we wanted to be able to deliver that. Now, while I wish I could say that we had, I had this brilliant idea by myself to be able to want to connect families this way, um, it was actually as a result of uh, what my mom did for me when I was serving time in prison as a teenage kid. Hmm. Wow. And Dr. Sylvia, can you, I'm sorry, Dr. Bola, can you, Give us a background on what it was like raising two children in DC's Metro in the eighties. Absolutely. And thank you again for having us here. Um, as a single parent with two children living in the DMV, it was uh, you know really challenging, but I know that it was my faith in God that kept me and continues to keep me and make me uh, to be strong in him. I'm excited just knowing that I'm the third generation of preachers my grandfather was a preacher. Um, my mom was a pre preacher. And um, I responded to that call to preach when my son Marcus was 10 and my daughter was 12, 13 years old. And so I know that it was my faith in God that gave me the strength to keep moving forward every day uh, in spite of what we were going through. And I relied solely on the scriptures. You know, God said, I never leave you or forsake you. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and you know, we just we just went from, you know, living uh, in a single family home in the suburbs and having to, after separation and divorce, having to move out of the comfort of a of, of, of real you know, family home and um, my family and friends were very supportive, and we went from a two-bedroom to a three-bedroom, and then um, and then I eventually, uh, when Marcus uh, was incarcerated, sentenced, I ended up um, moving into an efficiency, and and then um, the it, it, it brightened up, and I was eventually able to purchase a new a new home. Excuse me, a new home in the suburbs. So this began a real journey of a lot of uncertainties. Each of these things for us uh, on own challenges. As I said, when I responded to the call to ministry uh, and preaching, I I needed to go back to school. So I worked on my bachelor's degree with 
two children and going to school and working and uh, just making sure that they had food and clothing and and a, a home to live in and, and felt safe and secure. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, when we all get together and start talking about what happened back then, the children often talk about the fact that um, they knew what we were going to eat on Saturday because I would cook a big pot of spaghetti. I cook a big um, uh, pot of <laughs> vegetable soup with <laughs> noodles. Um, I'd have some beef. So they ate. They didn't think that they were eating good, but they ate. And, <laughs> um, and they often talk about, you know, they couldn't wear the, you know, the latest fashion and the latest shoes. And I said, I'm an educated consumer. I go to Sims <laughs> and with, mm. you know, uh, quality merchandise at a reduced price. So, you know, I say all that to say that they had what they needed. They had food, they had clothing, they had shelter. Um, I was in school, they were in school, they were doing what they were supposed to do. I was trying to do the best that I could do to make sure that um, they were able to uh, flourish and, and, and do good in school. And so it was challenging, but it was good. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the spaghetti was amazing, though. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, Marcus, I was watching the, the video of your interview on Vice, and it started off as you've always had this entrepreneur spirit in your mind. And, that, and I always talk about with conscious and bias, commonalities, builds understanding and connection. And when I was a kid, my mom used to fry these chips and I would sell them in school. And then I moved that into a paper route, which is similar to like you buying the candy and then selling that. And so um, I have a feeling that was an influence in your, from your mother. So can you tell me about how your mother has had a tremendous impact in your life and what's the biggest lesson she taught you? I mean, you know, you're talking about going back years and years. I mean, that that question, the answer to that question changes over every stage of of the journey. When I was a kid, I mean, my mom, the impact my mom had on my life then was she was the disciplinarian. She was the teacher. She was the one that wanted to make sure that I was in church on Sundays and that I, you know, tried as best I could to get good grades in school on the weekdays. Um, I was a talker. I was a basketball player. I was animated. I was the class, you know, fun person. And so um, my mom, I don't know if, if at that time she would be able to say that she saw all of those ancillary things that were outside of what she wanted to instill in me would be the, the tools that would lay in my toolkit that would, you know, breed some success many, many years later. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting, you know, growing up in, in you know, going through this era um, when the DC area was like known for violence and it was plagued by all of the folks that stood outside of my apartment doorsteps who were doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with whatever kind of drugs they had in their pocket. And I was enamored by that. My mom talked about her going to school and going to work and wanting to try to provide for my sister and I. We weren't trying to hear, she was an educated consumer. We, I wanted Jordans and girls like the dudes with Jordans. You know, so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be able to do that. And, and it was interesting because that's when she became, you know, she began to have a lot less influence on my life then, right? Like now the people who I was enamored by who drove the Mercedes Benz out front, they were the people who had more influence. And, you know, while I grew up, you know, selling Nihilators and Blow Pops and, you know, Mambas and Skittles and Snickers at, on a school bus and then eventually in school, um, it, it, the $30 and $50 a day in quarters didn't seem to match what was needed in order to be like one of the cool kids that stood outside of my apartment steps. And so, um, I, you know, I, I hid that fascination from my mom and I wanted to go head first into what became this new life of mine where a prosecutor would later call me a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I would eventually um, get arrested for the carjacking that would change my life during my sophomore year of high school. And when I got sentenced um, by for, by the judge for that carjacking, I honestly didn't understand what was going on, the magnitude of what was happening in that court case. And while he was focused on trying to instill um, this disciplinary um, punishing moment inside of my own psyche, in my mind, I'm thinking like, yo, dude, you got to hurry up and let me get through this so I can go back and go play in the state championships against Sherwood High School or report back to my earth science class because it's going to drop my GPA too much if I keep missing too many days from, from school because of these court proceedings. 
And I had no idea of the legal ramifications when they would use terms, you know, like, um, you know, pre-sentencing report or arraignment or when they would eventually certify me as an adult that would then land me in front of the judge that would finally sent sentence me to eight years in adult maximum securities during that same sophomore year of high school. Growing up in prison, you know, as a, you know, 15 year old kid, 16 year old kid, 17 year old kid, 18 year old kid, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, all of my formative years growing up inside of some of the state of Virginia's worst prisons um, led my mom to have a, even less influence on my life then. Um, she wasn't the one that I would see every day and she couldn't guide some of uh, the, 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 the issues that I would see or how I would interpret life. She was no, she was longer there to give me that. And what was interesting would be that um, she would show up in a very fascinating place while I was in prison because now like I'm starting to wrestle with this new reality that I'm going to have to actually grow up there. And while I became angry and frustrated through the journey, um, my mom would make a commitment to me when I was in prison to write me a letter or send me photos when I was um, when I was there to be able to kind of sort of help neutralize some of what I would see. All of those, you know, fights on the rec yard, the dead bodies, you know, getting wheeled down the rec yard in a body bag after a war will break out. All of the, you know, the things, the pressures that the correctional officers will put on the residents that that live there, like all of those things that would drown out any level of happiness or gratefulness or thankfulness that she would try to instill in me in those year, those yesteryears, um, were now fading. And her photos and letters would kind of sort of reel me back into what the possibilities of life could look like. Um, and I'm grateful for for that new level of influence. Um, when I was in prison. So shout out to you. Thank you for that. But what the, the, I think was dope about it was that, you know, coming home from prison and now following along her new path of new hope and audacity and prayer, answer prayer and all of these things that she was trying to convey to me in those letters were starting to come and trickle in as a reality. And, and, and then um, I became even more grateful for that positive influence that, you know, would eventually evolve and grow into this bustling adulthood that would allow me to be able to bring her in um, as we wanted to create a company that brought that same ethos or same magnitude of love and empathy um, into, into, the, into the country. We knew that when we were starting this tech company, we wanted to be able to solve a problem. The bigger problem that we wanted to solve outside of the families we wanted to create was the ability to be able to erase stigma for the people that are sitting in those prison cells and showing what the possibilities were after prison and also what the power of love and empathy can do um, like what my mom did for me when I was sitting there uh, many years ago. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I mean, given your, your experience, how do you both feel, um, like what are some of the, the larger systemic issues related to our justice system? I mean, you know, that's it. That's a hard one, she's man. Like, look, here's the thing. At the end of the day, you know, I mean, the justice system is the justice system. It was designed to do exactly what it's been doing. You know what I mean? Like, you know, since back in the days, you know, I mean, require reading is like go back and go read the 1619 Project. Go back, you know, and, and, and read um, books around the, the era of Jim Crow. And, and, and I think that, you know, folks will begin to educate themselves around how um, the background of imprisonment or corrections came as a result of, you know, slavery and how we wanted to figure out ways how to keep this new perpetuating system um, of keeping black bodies inside of these cells and, and, and punished to, in a way that allowed them, folks to be able to um, leverage these black bodies in, in profitable ways. That was a, the backbone of it. So it's been running the way it's supposed, supposed to run. Now, yeah. with that being said, um, one of the questions I ask myself is, how do we combat some of the issues that we are, that I saw in corrections? How do I figure out ways to be able to kind of sort of dismantle some of the, the, the tools that end up in a lot of the legislators' tools kits that would keep people like me inside of some of those cells? And we landed on figuring out ways how to articulate the value of humanity and dignity for, for folks in prison and learn how to be able to introduce technologies that are there. But I think that there's some underlying things that I think that we can help to also um, do as build as a community in order to be able to solve this problem. One of them is definitely by far increasing the ability to, to give communication tools to folks that are there in these prisons, whether it's letter writing phones, 
um, email systems, tablet systems. You know, we talk about the lack of internet in prison. And I'm like, yo, for the life of me, I can't understand why we can't put barriers on or restrictions on some of the sites that folks can't access so that it will become less of a security risk for facilities and allow for folks to be able to have access to some of the same learning opportunities via the internet that you and I share every day. That's how we all grow. I tell you, I built FlickShop on Google and YouTube. So I can only imagine what the men and the women that are sitting in those cells would be able to do when, you know, well before they came home if they had access to some of the same tools that you and I do. One of the other things that I think that needs to shift is a conversation around policy in the home. You know, I live we live right here in D.C. where, you know, a few miles away is, you know, the Capitol building where we think that a lot of these decisions are had. We think that the Capitol Hill is where policy decisions are made. And I'll tell you where they are made. They're made at the dinner table. They're made in the places where you and I are having conversations that allow for us to be able to bring the Marcuses and the Sylvias into the family conversation that snowball into an ecosystem that allows for all of us to feel with one another. Talk about how the power of empathy allows us to be able to do that. Sympathy is very different. Sympathy says, hey, I want to feel for you, right? But empathy is saying, I feel with you and understanding that we're all one or two degrees away from the horrible um, the, the horrible uh, result of having an over-incarcerated population. So if we want to be able to make um, you know, cities and communities safer, let's think about what that really looks like and, and, and think about what... what with correction should, 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 how it should operate. And then lastly, I'll say one of the things that, um, that we want to be able to solve with the ailments that I think that is really, really pre preventing folks from coming home and doing well are reentry programs that are available inside of these facilities and externally outside of the facilities. How we think about reentry is so like how much most, most people think about um, customer support. It's like, it's so reactive. You know, we are reacting to the problems instead of thinking about building a customer success matrix that says we should be proactive. Let's think about what we should do before people come home so that we solve the problems before they even happen. If we're being thoughtful about giving folks that are in sales social capital or access well before they come home, then I promise you we'll have a more a better success rate and we'll lower recidivism, which is now harboring at around 76% um, for people that are coming out of these sales and going right back within three years. Yeah, we got to figure out a way to solve that. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, we make it. So it's, it's, I'm on the board of uh, this company called Himsa, and it's my friend who started. It, and he basically goes into into prisons every week and teaches yoga and, and basketball, right? So it's teamwork and mental mentalization, and it's been really effective for getting people redeployed once they leave the prison system. But we have all these like structural issues from a staffing perspective, where companies won't hire people because they have a background crime, they can't, don't pass a criminal background check, whether it's a violent or nonviolent crime. We've just grouped everything in one place. And so I think there are some like laws and rules that we need to change. And I think that's starting to happen. But if you can't get a job when you get out, then what are you going to lean back on? You're going to get right back into the same same string of cycle of, of of crime. And so I think we have to be more embraced and enable, enable people. I would, um, I would just like to say too that as a mother, um, the biggest issue I see um, happening is this sentencing uh, youth as adults. Uh, I think that that is just criminal in and of itself True. and uh, overcrowding, if you will, in um, many of the uh, prisons out there. Yeah. It's also honestly just from like an economic policy, it's a bad decision. Like we're spending $200,000 a year to, to put somebody in a prison versus giving them a job. <laughs> like it just doesn't make sense to me. You know, I mean, if you look at Portugal, they, they realized that heroin wasn't a crime, it was a disease. And so they, the way they reduced their um, dependency on it was they first, the government first gave everyone needles, so they stopped like the spread of disease. And then over time, they weed, weeded off, off the needles and got them healthy and gave them um, mental health to sort of overcome this stuff. It wasn't throwing them in jail and like filling the, filling the populations that way. It wasn't solving an issue. And so 10 years later, it's reduced the, the footprint of both drug use and um, the size of their prison system. So I think we use use it as a tool rather than, than to to, um, to identify a symptom and handle it, but we don't actually go to the underlying cause and fix that. And, reduce and it's it. masked under the mirror of like a public safety, right? Like, Completely. nah, no, no. It doesn't make any of us safer. No data supports that. And so um, I'm grateful that you brought up the, one of those, you know, those kinds of models. I mean, I think we have a lot to learn from 
a lot of the countries that are, are doing corrections. Yeah, well. absolutely. So I flip, take it, let's take it to the flip side. So flip, flip shops, I'm um, doing partnerships with large organizations. I think a lot of the company people watching this are from corporations on what they can do to help move the ball forward here. So can you talk to me about the AWS partnership and, and how did you make that happen? And what, and, and what, what is the partnership about? Yeah, I'm so grateful for our partners over at AWS. Um, and, you know, all of our, you know, larger enterprise solution partners that are being more thoughtful about increasing their community engagement strategies or their social impact strategies. We want to be able to learn how to be able to support them. There's this one singular conversation that's being had at the water cooler around the justice system that's being ignored by a lot of the um, the, the folks that are sitting inside of the, the, the ivory towers. And they're learning that, you know, this is not the best way to be able to contribute to our, our teams that want to have these kinds of conversations. And so a lot of these companies are bringing my, me and my mom in to facilitate a conversation around uh, the, the criminal justice system and the power behind uh, building these kinds of moments of empathy with between corporate partners and the residents and the families that um, they're, they're mostly shop with them, these companies. Uh, and then as we figure out ways to be able to create that that mesh, that gel and that relationship, which typically results in us, you know, uh, allowing the companies to be able to adopt a state, which provides free flick shop credits to our family members so that they can send flick shops completely for free. Or maybe it results in a fun activity that allows for the fe the, the team events. I mean, the, the teams to send uh, anonymous postcards to people inside of uh, these 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 sales around the country. We call those flick shop team events. Um, sometimes it ends up in a sponsorship uh, for our flick shop school of business, where we introduce other returning citizens that are coming out of jails and prisons. Uh, we introduce them to the tech and, and entrepreneurship spaces. I tell them all the time, there's a big bag in the tech industry and, and, and it should be filled with more diverse voices and faces. And some of those diverse voices and faces are coming out of neighborhoods or sales that look like the ones that I slept in. And so I want to figure out ways to be able to create that kind of sort of bridge where folks know that they're benefiting in an immense way by having these kind of sort of diverse conversations um, and being more inclusive in, in, in bringing these, this community back into um, their offices. But they, they struggle with, you know, real strategies on how to deploy that. And so they lean on us for that expertise. Um, I'm excited that so many of those partners like AWS and Delta, Boeing, Bank of America, Meta, Slack, they're using our platform in order to be able to connect with people in very interesting and meaningful ways around the country uh, that are sitting in these sales. And um, it's one of the things I'm grateful for. What's the population of or the percentage of the population that's incarcerated currently? Yeah, it's over 2 million people that's locked up in the U.S. So it's like around 2.2, 2.3 million people that's locked up in, um, in the U.S. And that's between local county, jail, state, federal prisons, um, juvenile detention, and even ICE detention centers. Um, and there's uh, a little less than 11 million that are incarcerated globally. Um, and so while the United States has the largest incarcerated population in, um, by, by a landslide uh, close to anyone else around the, around the world, we do know that this really is still a global issue. And while we want to be very intentional about solving this problem here at FlickShop um, here in the U.S., uh, we, we are thoughtful about what's happening um, and the trends that are happening globally. Wow. So we have 20% of the incarcerated population and we have probably like 5% of the world's population. It's crazy. Something like that. It's crazy. Um, Flick Shop was born out of out of a need that you wanted to solve to make communicating with loved ones in prison easier and make and provide lifetime of support. Today, Flick Shop's expanded to connect to businesses that are building social impact strategies and community engagement that teams want to solve for mass incarceration. Can you talk about the initiatives with other partners such as Google and Boeing that you're doing? Yeah, so the the, the ones with that I'm excited about with with Google is really is really fascinating. Uh, we're working with Google and their Grow with Google teams to be able to introduce digital literally digital literacy skills uh, to women and men that are coming out of these sales. Now, what that means is you have a, a, a shift, a massive shift inside of the employment pool, knowing that while some companies are banning the box, shout out to all of you guys that are being thoughtful about second chance hiring, making second chance hiring strategies to your companies, um, that shift is allowing them access to a plethora of people who are, have brilliant ideas and want to be thoughtful members of their teams. Uh, they want to be able to contribute in demonstrable ways. Downside of it is they've never sent an email before. 
they don't know what a CC is, and they don't know the difference between CC or BCC. Sometimes, <laughs> right? Like this reality, right? Sometimes, you know what I mean? Like we take some of these, some of these things for granted because these are tools and technologies that we use every day. But if they were anything like me, that I went to prison before there was the internet. I came home, there was Google. <laughs> Can you imagine what it's like to be able to search for something? that appears on a screen for the very first time. And then you wondering whether or not this thing is actually even real or what's tracking you or what it sees or what it knows about you. Like it was a whole thing I had to get through. We're trying to figure out how to avail myself one, to be able to, to uh, participate inside of this new technological boom. But then also in order to be able to compete with some of the other people that are coming out of the, some of the best schools and colleges around the country that are applying for the same jobs I'm applying for. Mm -hmm. So how do we help prepare some of these women and men uh, when they come home from prison um, to be able to compete inside of this new digital landscape? Uh, we wanted to be able to solve that problem and our partners at Google are helping us to do just that. I love that. And it's smart because you're doing good can be profitable because they're building their next customer base, right? If you think about it. So it's it's a smart ecosystem. It all kind of comes back together. Um, that's you not that smart business. <laughs> exactly, right? And it's it's doing and it's and it's doing good for society. So you found you found a flip flip flick shop flick shop business, yeah flick shop school of business, a program that teaches returning citizens life skills and entrepreneurship via computer coding and software development. What are what other things need to happen to better support you um, and the people you're you're helping to return to the workforce and offer them more pathways to employment? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I mean, it's one of the questions I ask myself often. Uh, the Flickshop School of Business came as a result of an award that we won uh, from Aspen Institute during the Aspen Ideas Festival several years ago. It wasn't a part of our core business model, but the question that we did ask ourselves is how would the women and men that are coming home from prison respond if they had access to a Marcus or like my, who was then my co-defendant and best, now best friend um, and now attorney, a practicing attorney, and Yale School law graduate, um, my best friend. How do how do you turn the next wave of people into into this? Who are the future Marcuses? And what I tell folks, you know, all the time when I go back and visit these sales, that look, y'all are the before, I'm the after, and I want to help give you the skills and the tools that you need in order to be able to accelerate that new growth trajectory that's waiting on the other side of your release date. But I think that there's some real, you know, very strategic things that um, principles that I want to be able to deliver to you. Some around soft skills, some around really good hard skills like web design, data engineering, um, uh, uh, pitch deck creation. Those are real hard skills that will allow our scholars to some of them enter the gig economy and be able to produce immediate revenues, income while they're in our actual program. Other scholars will be able to have the skills that they need in order to be able to be the entrepreneurs um, inside of, you know, some of, some of our, fa our, you know, our favorite restaurants or clothing stores. I tell my scholars all the time, look, I don't got a problem. If you don't want to be an entrepreneur like me, the, the entrepreneurship ain't everybody. You know what's how hard it is to be an entrepreneur? But if you want to go get a job at Chipotle, oh, oh, you're going to be the CEO of Guap. Oh, you going to do, you are going to make sure that everybody that comes in this Chipotle remembers exactly why they go to the M Street Chipotle. This there's a reason why they do that. And you are going to have the, the pride of ownership of this. And you're going to move through the store. You're going to move through the product line. You're going to understand the line. You're going to understand the, 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 the financial model. You understand the revenue model. These terms won't be vocabulary words that you'll be hearing for the first time on your 17th day of work. You would have been well prepared to walk into this store and say, hey, look, there's a path for me that's paved with gold that says that I can end up in a, in a more senior level than where, than where I'm sitting right now. And it doesn't matter that I have a felony conviction because I'm very, very, very capable. And if we do our job successfully, then we have our graduates leaving out of our classrooms, going forth to go crush the thou. Yeah, absolutely. And you just brought up another thing that I never really thought about is IQ doesn't determine whether you're in, in jail or not, right? So there's a lot of talented people that come out that we just, that just weren't take, taking down the right path. And if you can help nurture them, you probably get a lot of productivity out of them, much more than you might think from a, even an average person who didn't get caught. And she's been doing whatever else. <laughs> There's no other environment where we don't think about pro uh, professional development. Yeah. In, in fact, I, forget in corporate structures. 
there's no there's there's no niece or nephew that's graduating from a college or university that's coming home back to the family where family members aren't running to them and saying, what can I do to support you in this next wave of your life? Who do I need to introduce you to? I remember that you majored in um, you know, psychology, and I don't even I don't know nobody does that, but I went to school with somebody who does this thing. I would love to be able to make an introduction for you. We all understand the power of these, this kind of social collateral, social capital that we have inside of our community this way. Um, but we forget that there's um, a community of marginalized folks who may not so much have that. And I want to be able to shift that conversation so that we are more welcoming and we are, we are more thoughtful about um, what we're building for the next generation of leaders that are coming out of these sales. Absolutely. So speaking of that, can you tell me about Flick Shop's angel program? Mm. And having get involved, we will love that. I would love to do that. It's the thing that we're most proud of. I mean, we love our Flick Shop Angels program. Um, it allows for our community to be able to band together with us and provide Flick Shop credits that we give to families, most of them with children with incarcerated parents, allowing that kid to send their incarcerated mom or their dad as many funny face selfies as they want completely for free. The children that you know are sitting at home, these are the invisible victims that very few of us think about when someone goes to jail or prison. And we want to be able to make sure that we help to keep them connected with their family members in, in, in real ways. Um, we understand the power of a double tap when we're scrolling through an Instagram and we're loving a picture. We understand the power of sharing a tweet because we thought that it would provide value to the people who follow us. Um, but the people who are sitting in those sales are the ones that are forgotten about, and we want to be able to allow for our community to band together with us. So those members can become Flick Shop Angels by purchasing Flick Shop credit that we give to these children and other family members with incarcerated parents so that they can Flick Shop completely for free. That's awesome. And are there um, ways that we can get involved to either change public policy or if we want to hire, we want to get access to a candidate pool of um, formerly incarcerated people? Like, how do we find the talent if we want, if we want to get, if you want to hire them? So you first send, send us an email at info at flickshop.com and all of the people who write to us from prisons and jails all around the country who are lo looking for opportunities, who are incredible candidates, we would love to connect them with your companies or your businesses. For those that want to learn more about policy and legislation around ban the box, which will allow for you to be able to take that box off of your job applications that ask people if they've been convicted of a felony, then please definitely shoot me an email, info at flickshop.com. We would love to be able to connect you with some of the organizations that are very being very intentional and in fighting for exactly that. They're also being thoughtful about the research that they're putting out that impacts some of these policy decisions. One of those organizations are one of the ones that I proudly am a board member of, the Justice Policy Institute. We're being very thoughtful about some of the research that we're doing that allows for folks to be able to make better and more informed decisions about not only how to manage correctional facilities, but also how to be able to make sure we people that are home. Other organizations around the country that are also being thoughtful about some of the policies that are sweeping and, and giving amazing opportunities for people like me that are coming out of these sales. One of my favorites are the Clean Slate Initiative, where they're being very thoughtful about how to introduce new legislation inside of inside of states around the country um, that are going to, that are giving people that these people that have family convictions a clean slate to now come home and then try to return back to their communities and be the you know the barber in their their neighborhood or go to the dental or hygienic school so that they can be participating members of their community in interesting ways. They want to come home and try to figure out how to be the basketball coach of their kids' program or to be able to sit in a PTA. All of these things, including an occupational licensing that are being blocked by felony convictions for folks that are coming out of these sales. If we want to be thoughtful about how to be able to reduce recidivism and be able to make communities safer, I promise you, one of those strategies should be figuring out ways to be able to support the, those folks and those organizations that are doing just that. Um, and so I'm proud to be able to figure out ways to collaborate with all of you guys that are thinking about going um, just that for your companies. I love it. That was really helpful. And I'm, I hope everyone um, wrote that down and they're going to reach out to you. Um, Dr. Bullock, if there's, there's um, strength and vulnerability and there's also 
opportunity and adversity. What's your biggest hope for the next generation? I mean, seeing what Marcus has done and how he's how he's really turned adversity into opportunity is amazing. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts around that. Yeah, so as Marcus was talking about the Bookshop School of Business, I think that education is the key uh, that for our young people, this next generation to become educated, stay educated. Counseling is very important. Listen to words of wisdom from our elders, if you will, and have a respect for them and be the change that you want to be. One of the things that Marcus was always say when he um, was incarcerated, mom, I'm going to change the world. And I'm like, change the world? But he had that. And the reality is it's happening all around us that we are making an impact, that Flip Shop is making a difference. And you can make a difference too if you uh, put education and counseling, all of that, following uh, people who are going somewhere and not the negative thoughts that are out there in our world today. Be the change that you want to see happen. You and Grammy used to always say birds of a feather flock together. Oh gosh. <laughs> I, I think oh, you know, like yo, you know, one to surround yourself with, you know, one of the pieces yeah. of advice you give is like surround yourself with positive folks. You yeah. know what I mean? I think, yeah. you know, it's one of the things I love about FSB. It's like we bring people out of, you know, interesting communities, um, some of the same neighborhoods I lived in and hung around into our amazing offices and be like, yo, the first thing I was like, yo, go get you some elderberry kombucha. You know what it's like to be able to offer somebody some kombucha at your office when you just came home from doing the prison. They're like, first of all, what, like, what is that? First of all, what is kombucha? And I don't know what you try to give to me because it smells like beer. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I am grateful to be able to provide that kind of community. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's important. Yeah. Be the light. Be the light. Be the change that you want to see. So you're saying for us to expand our flocks and let others in. <laughs> right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so Marcus, what's uh I mean I, I think Holly's probably told you guys about micro progressions to conscious and bias, and they're like little action steps that we can use to make make the world a better place for each other. Um and so what's one action step or micro progression that as we call it a conscious and bias that leaders at all levels can practice to better support their employees from underserved populations, whether it be from formerly incarcerated people, people struggling with homelessness, um, or any other sort of um adversity. Yeah, so one of the micro things that I think that we all can do uh, is to be able to begin having a conversation around people first language. I think when we, we begin to use people first language, first of all, it helps us understand how to create spaces where we're bringing humanity and dignity into conversations when we're talking about folks who are sitting inside these cells. One of the reasons why we don't use words like inmate or prisoner or convict or any of those other terms is because these are identifiers that are placed on folks that have such incredible negative connotations that it reduces, the, we believe that it begins to kind of sort of erode at the humanity that someone would feel every time they get labeled by that term. We want to be able to figure out ways to be able to introduce people first language like formerly incarcerated or returning citizen or um, someone who was in prison or my friend Right. We don't have to put these kind of sort of labels on folks um, that create these micro aggressive ways of, of saying you are less than. Um, and, and while folks don't understand that, uh, it also gives you an opportunity to be able to shift the conversation when you do use that term. When you say, hey, you know, I was listening to a conversation earlier about, you know, this formerly incarcerated person, and his mom um, on LinkedIn, um, you know, that was, you know, in partnership with consciously bias, unbiased. It, it, it forced them to say, well, what do you mean by formerly incarcerated? Why didn't you just call them prisoner? Why didn't you just call them convict? And then we can answer and say, look, because we want to be able to help restore the dignity for everyone inside of our community. And not just the folks who are our friends in our immediate circle, in our immediate ecosystem, but all of the folks, including the ones who sleep and sit in these marginalized communities as well. Absolutely. That was inspiring. Um, Dr. Bullock, do you have anything else to add to that? Uh... I, I, I'm just sitting here, you know, thinking about, you know, all that Marcus has gone through and the light that he gives forth in our community and the impact that he's making with uh, working with uh, formerly incarcerated individuals and just um, seeing everyone that we come in contact with, with, uh, with a purpose, with um, a God-given talent, you know, gift and looking to see the very best in everyone that we come in contact with. So, and I see the best right here. 
I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a crazy journey, though. I mean, don't let my mother fool you. You know how many stressful nights I put her through? You know what it must be like to be able to get a call to say your 50 year old kid, you know what I mean? Just like carjack somebody and, you know, it's in life in prison. I can only imagine that. I mean, it's pretty dope to be able to now be, you know, sitting in our corner offices and have these kinds of conversations and want to spread impact around the country. But it's a really rewarding feeling to hear my mom talk about. The work that we do this way. Very, That's very inspiring. Cool. You guys are both very inspiring and keep doing what you're doing. And if there's anything we can do to support, absolutely let us know. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Live today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Shout out to the entire to, to the community that supports us in incredible ways. Um, I stand on the shoulders of so many giants um, and so many people who I Google and YouTube every day to learn how they do this amazing work um, when I feel so alone and tired and beat up. And I struggle and I don't know the answer and I'm trying to figure out how to avoid another failure. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for our community that, that lifts me up, whether or not, you know, all of you guys who who pray for me, the folks who, you know, become affliction angels and support our community, the folks who use our platform and send postcards and incarcerated loved ones. So thankful for you guys, um, the folks who write about us or host us on their shows and and try to be able to bring more awareness about the work that we do, because um, sometimes this can be thankless work inside of an industry that typically is relegated to the shadows. So I'm grateful for you all. Thank you. Thank all right, you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. <laughs>